Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Hey, everyone. All right. So we are going to kick off this little uh, special edition flexibility podcast that uh, a lot of people have been asking for. And I thought was really an appropriate time to put this out, given the course that we're putting out right now. So I essentially want to break down, you know, quickly five of kind of the biggest things that I got wrong as a younger coach and a younger medical provider about uh, flexibility in general, but more specifically, like hypermobile or gymnastics or dance or cheerleading or, you know, more aesthetic sport type flexibility that you need, right? So Everyone probably knows I work a lot in gymnastics, but also with a lot of uh, ballet dancers, cheerleaders, um, people who are in like hyper mobile type sports, right? Like circus artists, all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of this weird, like, you know, black hole of uh, the culture in all these sports is like what we need to do to get really good improvements and flexibility and make those things stick around, but also make those things last, right? And make those things be things that show up in the actual skills that we're training. So I think when I was starting out as a younger medical provider, I was just doing what I think a lot of people had done before me. And it's totally fine, right? Like I was just trying the best that I could as many, many other people are. But I quickly found out that it was very, very frustrating, right? I was not seeing really good improvements in the flexibility of the athletes that I was coaching, or people I was helping for medical issues or stuff like that. And it was just like, man, what is going on here? Why is this not working? And so I spent like a, the better portion of about 10 years, like completely digging into the research, the science, trying things, different approaches, different, you know, thoughts uh, that people had combining them with what I thought. And I found a lot of things that didn't work. And I found a lot of things that I really like, you know, face palmed myself. And it was like, Oh, my goodness, I can't believe that, you know, I never thought of this, or I'd applied this research that I found that was really like around like in the 90s, the early 2000s, stuff like that. And even more recently, uh, all the way up to some of the studies we'll talk about today, like, you know, things that are coming out currently that are, I think, is really not being read and applied at all. So my hope is that I can save everybody listening to this a a monstrous amount of time and effort and work by summarizing some of these things um, and hopefully just sharing some of the biggest mistakes that I made and then and then trying to maybe understand a better way to approach it for not only more effectiveness, but also just safety, right? Like we all know that we only have so much time with athletes to work with. We're trying to find the most effective dosage and the most effective methods we know as the research supports right now. But also we want to make sure that we're trying to stay as safe as possible. And if new things come out about the way certain stretches or certain approaches maybe aren't the, the most effective from a safety point of view, we instantly need to update our methods and make sure we're doing that safely. So I hope this podcast serves as kind of like a, a nice little summary and a nice little educational concept to get a lot of information that's out there, probably more condensed into something you can digest. But I hope it's a conversation starter, right? I hope that everybody you know, shares this podcast with their eight colleagues or their friends or other coaches they work with or some parents that are questioning about some of the stuff and maybe summarize some things that are hard to explain or understand if you're not a medical provider or if you're not a nerd like me who wants to read a bunch of research studies. So I'll show the studies in an effort to just make sure you know, I'm clarifying some points or explain that these things are legit. I'm not just making this up. But obviously, you don't need to you know dig into all these studies if you want. We will include all the research uh, in the show notes and all that kind of stuff. But um, more so, it's just a way to kind of help you along the way. So Usually when I listen to podcasts or I go through these things that are like, you know, the five or six best things, they dance around and they kind of don't share anything, uh, the things that are really most impactful because they're trying to hide stuff. So I'd rather just share directly the most important things from the beginning and give you as much value as possible than make this, you know, a waste of time. So number one, by far the biggest mistake I used to always make is aiming for intensity, not consistency. Okay. And the difference obviously is it maybe is easy to recognize is now knowing what I know and I'll explain why. I aim for consistency first and a moderate or appropriate amount of discomfort with stretching or flexibility work, but it's certainly the reverse of what I used to think, right? So I used to think as a younger coach that um, because I thought that, you know, stretching was literally stretching out muscle tissue itself, and we'll get more to that later um, about why that's maybe not the most current thinking. I used to think that because we are actually stretching out muscles and making them longer, that the only way to make improvements in flexibility was being very, very aggressive with the the intensity, the, the duration, the, the number of stretches we were doing, the number of exercises, how long we were doing it. And it was just like, you know, every day you got to go hard on flexibility. Like, like, and I mean, like, aggressive, right? To the point of like, just take, you know, no pain, no gain kind of stuff. Like just, just go ahead and put stretch as hard as you can. And what I quickly found through practical experience first was that it backfires oftentimes is one, it's not really comfortable. So athletes are really hard buy-in wise, but two is that it's not really the most effective strategy because we might not be stretching the appropriate structures that we want. What I mean by that is we want to always be focusing on the muscles themselves and not ligaments or joint capsules or things that might be a little bit dangerous for a really hypermobile athlete, like a gymnast or a cheerleader or a ballet dancer to, imp to increase more flexibility because they're already pretty hypermobile from a ligament, ligament point of view. So 
when I say intensity, I was saying, you know, we want to go to the most possible uncomfortable, tolerable limit we could do. And then just hang out there and do a bunch of sets and a bunch of reps. And I think the, I, I intuitively stopped doing this a few years in because it wasn't effective in terms of like people would get like reactively tight and be really sore and it would never seem like it was working. I now realized that it was probably causing some micro trauma to the area and we were probably a little bit too much, right? And that was causing someone to kind of bounce back and get tight. But also the buy-in was was almost never, never there. Like unless I as a coach was watching someone and looking directly at them, they were stretching, right? Very, very few people, including myself as a younger athlete, would actually do the amount of time and effort it needs to make things work. And so now knowing what I know, and especially with this really good study from uh, Thomas in 2020, which summarizes a lot of these kind of things, um, it definitely shows that consistency is by far and away probably the most important thing for us to think about, right? Consistently doing stretching or some sort of flexibility work five to six days per week seems to be the most effective dosage when we're doing the proper, you know, stretches based on screening, we're doing the proper technique, and we're using that motion right away, you know, or sometime in our practice or sometime later on, that's just make it like stretch and go away. So I will share uh, this sheet here. If you're listening, you can see this on our YouTube channel, but I just want to show these graphics, right? So these graphs down here are really, really cool because they kind of summarize. This is a, called a meta analysis. So they go through and they summarize all of the different pieces of research that are available and they try to like put them all together and say, okay, what's the best recommended dose? And this was a, a giant uh, review study. But what this figure on the right here showed is that the amount of stretching per week that you needed to be effective, right? When you look here, it says two is, is you know a moderate amount. But as you go up to three, five, six, and seven, you can see here that it seems to be that five to six days per week seems to be the most important uh, you know, variable in terms of how many days per week you need to stretch if your goal is to increase range of motion, right? So this study looks at stretching and improving flexibility, passive flexibility, or increasing range of motion. So what they showed is that five to six days per week seems to be the sweet spot here. And interestingly, once you start to get to like seven, it seems to actually have a, not a, a more positive return on investment. It seems that five to six days per week based on these articles is really, really the most effective. Okay. And with that being said, when they look at, okay, like how many days per week is one thing, but how much do you have to stretch that actual muscle group to make an improvement? Right. And so when they look at the total time that's broken down into stretching, right, they can look here at less than five minutes five to 10 minutes or greater than 10 minutes, right? And so what that breaks down to, if you actually think about it, is two two sets of 30 seconds of certain stretches or active flexibility work or drills and stuff. That's about, you know, five minutes per week, right? So you think about five to six days per week, if you're doing a, a certain muscle group, uh, two sets of 30 seconds on a static stretch or some active stretching or something, what you'll find is that they, they seem to see that that middle kind of sweet spot of about five to 10 minutes per muscle group is going to be important, right? So say you want to get your split better and you want your hamstrings to be more flexible or your hip flexors in the back to be more flexible. You'd probably want to do a few stretches or a few active flexibility drills every single day, minus one. So five to six days per week, right? With about two to sec two sets of 30 seconds or so. And they showed that under five minutes probably wasn't enough. But then if you really go crazy and you're going above 10 minutes, it doesn't seem to have a huge effect, right? It's a very minuscule difference, right? From, from five to 10 minutes or greater than 10 minutes here. So it's a really good thing to understand, right? Because we're, we're looking at, again, what's the minimal effective dose and what's going to be the most effective. It seems to be five to six days per week with two to sets of 30 seconds per muscle group of, of different types of stretching we'll talk about. It seems like those are going to be the most effective. Okay. And also really importantly to note out here is people are like, okay, what's better static stretching or dynamic stretching or ballistic stretching or all that stuff. If you look at the types of stretching in this graph above, they all work right with some caveats here, right? But a lot of things work to improve range of motion, whether it's active, passive, static, ballistic, uh, PNF. And the one thing I will say here is that people kind of poo poo static stretching sometimes, but if you look at the research, static stretching is effective to increase range of motion, right? It's actually the most effective out of these four or five categories they look at to improve flexibility passively. And we'll talk about why later. But I think that's a really important thing to remember is like static stretching is helpful, right? It's actually more helpful than other types of stretching to get range of motion to increase. People are worried about power reduction, but we'll talk about that in a few seconds, right? And then ballistic stretching probably is not as, a, as, as helpful to increase range of motion um, because maybe it's a little bit more aggressive and maybe it doesn't really have the same amount of like stretching duration that you would get from like a static stretch or a dynamic stretch. So what you see here though, is that like, you know, a static and active and passive, right? So active being dynamic type stuff, passive and active and static, again, all work comma, if they are done consistently, right? So I'd rather do something consistently five to six days per week. That's a moderate amount of discomfort, but it's easy to do for a young athlete or for someone I'm working with than be like, all right, on Sunday, we're doing our mobility day or like on two days per week at practice, we're going to do our 
big flexibility circuit and do every possible active flexibility drill we can possibly think of, right? I'd rather have someone who's doing a nice, good warm up, having some event side stations and doing some flexibility circuits a few days per week, because we know we're going to get five to six days of consistent stretching work done every single day or flexibility work done every single day. And that's probably going to be the most effective. Okay. So what I do definitely now for number one is I aim for consistency, right? With a moderate amount of discomfort. I do not aim for super, super high intensity, right? And I'll just say it flat out. Anyone who's pushing kids down in splits or using like super aggressive, like yanking on kids' legs back like that, completely inappropriate, right? 100% inappropriate because that person probably does not understand why stretching works and what this research is, and they're just being mean. So I think we're moving away from people doing that, thankfully, as we know more and more. But even in the most aggressive types of, you know, um, and, intense, I should say the most intense types of uh, flexibility demands, like so rhythmic gymnastics, ballet dancers, cheerleaders, people who need really extreme ranges of motion, we can still apply these principles and get super, super large amounts of flexibility for like what we need for contortionists or stuff like that. You can still get the same amount of progress if you are doing the proper steps of screening people, consistently using the right exercises, making sure you're doing the proper dosage of stretching, you can still get those same results all the way up to whatever the craziest flexibilities that you want to see in a sport, over splits, switch rings, crazy types of, you know, circus acts, stuff like that, you can still get those results if you apply these methods. Like you do not need, I think people oftentimes what happens is they apply what they think is going to work. Unfortunately, it's not supported by the latest science or some, some really good consistency. They get frustrated, so they go more aggressive, and they think, okay, more, more, more intensity. And what they do is they end up causing some irritation to the tissue, and it gets tighter as a reactive spasm, and they're stuck back on the same frustration point. So rather than just banging your head against the wall, right, you might want to think more critically and break down exactly why someone's not getting progress, right? Are they really stretching five to six days per week? Are they doing two to three, uh, two to three sets of 30 seconds per area, per muscle group per day? Right? Are they working with medical providers to break down exactly what they need? Are they using screens? Are they using eccentrics and, and more active flexibility on top? of that that stuff is way more important to check off the bucket list before you just start going crazy with the types of stretches that you're doing so um, i think that's the first important thing to start at because without that you start to really spin your wheels quite a bit okay the second thing which is very closely related to this is going to be a mistake i used to make like i've alluded to is not being updated to maybe not like the most you know aggressive science journals of all time but just understanding the basics of what the research supports for types of stretching types of foam rolling what you want to do all that kind of stuff right i was literally just flying against the the seat of my pants or flying by the seat of my pants right just like let's try some drills let's try these drills let's try these drills i saw these on youtube i saw this at a congress i saw this at a lecture right just throwing random active flexibility drills at everybody that i could do because they looked awesome like oh this looks so cool and like look at how good this is right nine times out of ten the videos that i saw of people doing it were like super hyper mobile naturally lax gymnasts who had very 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 loose joint capsules and they could do pretty much any active flexibility drill that you throw at them with great angles and huge lines like wow that looks so amazing right and you bring it back to your athletes and you apply it and like nobody can do it right because it's just so crazy of how hard it is you have to work your way up to these kind of things so now that I understand a lot of this research, again, one being five to six days per week, two sets of 30 seconds uh, per, per area of muscle group. The other thing that I think is important is thinking about the dosage of actual stretching per, per stretch, right? So like, what's the most effective dosage of a hold? And when you look over here on this one, this uh, graph down here is looking at how much time is spent during stretching on that muscle group, right? So how long you total time at two sets of 30 seconds, right? For like a, a left leg split drill or some sort of shoulder flexibility drill, right? So what you see here is that, right? Doing under 60 seconds, right? And then doing 60 to two, uh, 120, so one to two minutes or doing more than two minute long, long, long holds, right? Holding a split for two minutes. There's like, minimal, minimal difference in the effectiveness, right? So under 60 seconds, maybe is not enough to really make long changes. So if we hold like a split for like 60 seconds, right, maybe doing that's probably not the most effective. But even if you think about two sets of 30 seconds or even holding for a minute, there's not a huge difference here, right? So why in the world am I going to spend three minutes, two, three, four minutes in each split, which is still super popular in a lot of these cultures, gymnastics, ballet, dance, all that kind of stuff. They'll hold over splits or splits for like two plus minutes each, just two minutes on the right leg, two minutes on the left leg, two minutes on the left straddle, two minutes on the right straddle, right? Two minutes on a pike, right? They'll hold these things for like 10 to 15 minutes of just static stretching. And again, static stretching works to improve range of motion. I'm not saying don't static stretch, but if we know that under 60 seconds is, is like almost as effective as two plus minute holds, 
and coming down to understanding the science of why stretching works, which I'll talk about later, why in the world are we spending 15 minutes on four stretches, right? When we could just be doing two sets of 30 seconds and get the same effect. Again, a lot of this just comes down to education and coming down to what we understand. So now instead of just doing literally two plus minute holds, right? And saying we have to do only, you know, active flexibility all the time. I've, I've looked at the research and said like, okay, with this article and many others, what are the different things that we can do to make an effect, effective impact? And I try to combine those all now in a screen, right? So screening and then an application of a circuit, I'd rather do that than just hold static stretching only for five, 10, 15 minutes, right? So what I do now, based on what I've learned, is I'd like to take a screen and break down why somebody can't get into a proper split. Is it the front leg hamstring, the back leg hip flexor, which we'll talk about next, right? I want to figure out, okay, what are the limiting factors? What are the bottlenecks of this person's, uh, you know, flexibility demands? Maybe if I'm not a medical provider, I can work with someone, right? But I was able to learn those things and apply those and break down, okay, out of the 10 things that could be limiting this split, what are the two or three things we really need to work on? Let's work on those things five to six days per week with those two sets of 30 seconds per muscle group, because that five minute duration is really important. And then let's hold those for under 60 seconds, right? Two sets of 30 seconds to make sure that that's going to be effective. And then let's go use a bunch of other things that are supported in research to actually make really, really good impacts like eccentric strength training, right? Or then we go over and do some, uh, some active flexibility drills or use that inside some of our gymnastics drills or home programs to really make a circuit that's super effective based on all the things we know from literature and not just hold two plus minutes on the left leg, two plus minutes on the right leg, two plus minutes on the on the middle split, right? Because chances are, it will show a transient increase in range of motion, but it's going to bounce right back. And if you're being really aggressive, there's a really good chance you might have a backfire effect where the body, you know, gets a little bit overprotective and it kind of, you know, spasms a little bit to protect you. So I think that's the biggest third thing to take away, right? Or, sorry, second thing to take away is that it's not just about these long, long hold. It's not about just, just like cranking one day per week. I'd rather go five to six days per week, two sets of 30 seconds per muscle group around 60 seconds. So this article is really awesome. If, if people are looking this out, it has a lot of cool uh, summaries, but again, all these types of stretching work in this graph, we can see the five to 10 minute duration is probably the most effective, right? Per, per muscle group. Uh, and then down here that these really, really long hold might not be more effective than under 60 seconds. And that five to six days per week is probably going to be our, our kind of bread and butter for what we want to think about in terms of the starting point. Okay. So that's kind of the second thing I used to do that. I think I, I've changed quite a bit. Okay. The third thing is this is where it comes down to understanding what the goal is. Right. And so the third thing that I think I made a huge mistake on is I never really thought about what the specific intention or the goal was with my flexibility work. Okay. So I was just doing flexibility work in warmups and in side stations and all the time with kids that I coach at practice, or when I was giving away, you know, uh, programs for rehab and, and medical stuff to get their flexibility back after an injury. I just threw a bunch of random drills at someone. I didn't think about what the goal is. Right. And for here, there's kind of three main goals that come down to flexibility. Right. So one would be is trying to prepare the available range of motion that you have and get the body ready for a workout, right? Which is a warm up, right? A warm up though, you're not going to improve flexibility during a warm up, right? You're probably just going to prepare the available range of motion. And that said, the goal of a warm up, you don't really want to only get more flexible or increase range of motion. You want to get the body prepared for a workout, right? You want to get blood flow. You want to get the body warm. You want to get some of the power to increase. You want to wake up the nervous system. You want to get the heart and the lungs pumping. It's not only about flexibility in a warm up. It's about trying to actually get the body ready to go. So with that said, right, I think a lot of people sometimes freak out because they think that like everyone should have all their splits and have perfect flexibility every single warm up. But if you think about as a coach or what someone does like the day before a practice, there are times when I would prescribe like really, really hard leg strength circuits, right? A really hard leg workout the night before the day before. And I would come into practice, right, and see everyone who's sore and stiff and their splits would be high. I'm like, you got to get that split down. You got to get that split down. Whoa, I can't believe that split so bad. But it's my fault. I prescribed a really hard leg workout the day before. It's so like, of course, they're going to be sore and stiff, right? Anyone who's a human who's worked out understands like delayed onset muscle soreness and how hard it is to get your splits down and get your flexibility back a couple days after a really hard training session. So I think we're sometimes we're too hard on kids where we say like, you know, we expect them to go super hard on their strength and conditioning, but then also always be super flexible and have the most energy and always working hard. It's like, that's not how humans work, right? You don't just have an endless amount of energy and always have your flexibility and always have your power and strength, right? Like you have to be realistic with what you're doing with kids, right? So if you have a really, really hard training session, the next day, expect them to be a little sore, expect them to be a little tight. It's okay, right? And I think also when you look at what the best approach is for a warm up. 
automatically people freak out. This is where the static stretching thing happened. They're like, don't ever static stretch because that reduces power, right? The studies show that if you stretch statically and then you go to work out, your power is going to go through the tank and you're not going to be able to do anything explosive, right? If you look at the methods of some of those studies, right? Like they literally had someone static stretch for like five to 10 minutes and then go like very quickly try to work up to like a really, really heavy back squat or sprint right? Or do something super explosive, right? And like nobody with common sense would be like, all right, let's stretch for 15 minutes and then go do your most explosive movement possible for your sport, right? Like kind of ridiculous. So it's good those studies came out and showed some of those things because they think they're worried about dampening the nervous system and that kind of stuff. But there's been a lot of really good new research that's been saying like, you know, we need to clarify some of the, the murky waters here that if you look at the research as it came out, static stretching followed by a nice dynamic warm up and a nice slow progression to get the body ready, the power reduction is trivial, right? Like really, really minimal. And to the point where I don't think it's something we should be super, super, uh, you know, concerned about because we're doing things in a logical order. It's not only about, you know, the, oh my God, we're going to make someone who doesn't have their uh, power show up all the time. I think a really good paper for someone who's trying to look at this is this, uh, 2017 paper that came out by in the journal of, um, frontiers of uh, physiology, sorry, um, by Helmi Shabin. I hope I don't butcher that name, but essentially it just kind of looks at the, the literature in the last 10 years and tries to clarify some of these things, you know, what's the most important things, you know, to try to understand around dynamic stretching and power loss and all that kind of stuff. And it's a really good review paper that says we have to kind of like update our methods and not just kind of take the abstract of a study and say, Oh, no static stretching ever. It's not going to be good. And I get this question all the time. Like, should we be static stretching? Should we be doing dynamic warm up type like that? And a lot of the research shows that if your goal is to improve the, the body's prepared for, a, a, you know, training and get the, the blood temperature up and get all that kind of stuff going, dynamic is probably a better approach, right? Like a little bit of foam rolling will help, right? Some soft tissue work will help here. But dynamic uh, stretching and stuff, you can add in some static stretching again to try to just get the body ready to go. It's not going to be the end of the world, right? So here. This is a good summary. It says, in, in fact, short duration static stretching should be included as uh, an important warm up uh, component before the uptake of recreational sports activities due to the potential positive effect on flexibility and musculoskeletal injury prevention. Right. So essentially, just saying like dynamic is really good, but don't freak out if we do some static stretching. And we do some static stretching in our warm up. Right. We do a little bit of like you know positional split work, straddle, hold, pancake, all that kind of stuff, more for technique awareness, but also because we want to make sure we're adding in some of those proper positions. Right. So. I don't think that people should be freaking out as much about some of these things. There's, there's many other good papers that we can include here too. There's another one here by Olpert in 2017 that also reviews some of the, uh, you know, the, the flexibility demands and the different approaches that people have with how, how power reduction is there. But long story short is that you don't need to freak out if a little bit of static stretching is done in a warm up. It's not going to just plummet your power. Okay. So that said, that's a long, like roundabout answer, but the, what's the goal, right? So if the goal is to increase range of motion for, actual performance, right? To actually get the body ready, dynamic warm up is probably pretty good, right? Dynamic warm up and some static stretching mixed in with some like maybe some plyometrics, some active flexibility stuff, some kicks, some jumps, that's probably good, right? But if the goal is to increase range of motion, to actually improve range of motion, you're probably going to need to use some of that more circuit based approach that I just mentioned, right? So doing some active flexibility, doing some specific static stretching to the muscles you want to work on, importantly, adding eccentrics in eccentric strength training, which is a concentric contraction of a muscle is when maybe I bend my elbow and flex my arms, but closes the angle of the joint an isometric contraction would be if i just held the joint at one angle and just contracted as hard as i could but there was no actual motion an eccentric contraction is actually increasing the the joint angle as you go forward so maybe a negative bicep curl or a negative chin up lower or like sliding out into a split slider right that is what's eccentrically loading the muscle and there's some good research to show that a lot of the things that we're doing for static stretching or active flexibility probably aren't changing the length of muscle, but there are some really interesting studies that might suggest that doing some heavier eccentrics under load with like dumbbells or sliders or body weight could actually increase the muscle length itself through what's called the fascicle, right? So if you're not nerdy, don't worry about this, but it used to be thought that by stretching and eccentrically loading the area, we thought that we were adding what's called a sarcomere. So the, the functional unit of a muscle, we thought we were adding sarcomere number in series, but some newer studies, particularly this one in 2021 that I'll pull up, um, looked at like hamstring, um, fascicle length, right? So some more of the passive tissue elements. And they show they showed that over three weeks of doing Nordics, which are like negative tree falls, hamstring lowers, there actually was a pretty good 
increase in fascicle length in certain parts of the, the biceps femoris tendon, the hamstring tendon. So uh, I'll talk about this next, but essentially we think that eccentrics might be something that actually does increase the length of a muscle over time. So in a circuit, for example, if we're trying to work on splits, we might want to work on some uh, specific uh, uh, stretching or dynamic stuff. So maybe a leg lower flexibility drill or some sort of nice, good, true quad stretch with the hips tucked under engaging the glute to try to put some static stretching or some dynamic stretching through the quad, through the hip flexor. We also might want to do something like a rear foot elevated split squat, right? With your back leg up on a mat, doing a nice slow five second eccentric lower to try to actually induce some of this uh, changing in the length of the muscle itself. So we could also maybe do some like single leg RDLs with the hamstring and the front leg to try to get some of that eccentric overload to the hamstring. And there's been some other studies that showed also like five second lower with a five second bottom position hold under load might help induce some of these actual length changes over time. So these people use Nordics here, uh, Nordic hamstring lowers, which again, is just kneeling with your feet hooked under a bench and you're like slowly lowering your way off like a tree fall down chest to the ground. But there's a lot of options we can try to apply here uh, with some of the eccentric overload to see if we can get a nice effect here, right? So something again, the mistake I used to make is that I wasn't using uh, a nice evidence-based approach for what the goal was, right? Am I trying to get a warm up? Am I trying to do an actual increased range of motion? Or am I trying to recover the body maybe from a hard workout? Right. So now what I do is I think about, okay, what's the goal? If it's a good warm up, let's use all the things that we know in literature to support that, right? Some soft tissue prep beforehand with some foam rolling to increase blood flow, maybe increase some temperature, get the perceived soreness down, right? Maybe some uh, dynamic, some cardiovascular warm up, right? Getting the blood, uh, blood pump and get the heart rate up to warm the temperature up of the body, then do some nice dynamic work, do some static stretching built in there. And then let's go do some active flexibility or some basics, some kicks, some jumps. That's my approach to a warm up to get the body ready to do gymnastics or ready to do shoes and are ready to do ballet or dance or work out versus if I'm truly trying to improve range of motion, someone's really got a stiff passive flexibility issue. I'm giving them a circuit five to six days per week, right? Of a little bit of static stretching, a little bit of active flexibility and some eccentrics to try to do that over and over again to get that five to six days per week of, you know, 30, 30 or so seconds up to a, a minute of, of specific work in a nice little circuit with eccentrics to hopefully increase length over time. So right, I might give somebody little soft tissue work before and then a uh, true hip flexor and quad stretch leg lowers on the front leg for a hamstring. Maybe we do some uh, jumps or uh, some active flexibility kicks with bands. We do five reps of a single leg RDL on the front leg and then five seconds of a uh, rear foot elevated split squat with dumbbells on a five second lower five second hold. And then we go over and do some sort of drill that specifically tries to transfer that over to jumps or leaps like jumps on tumble track or something like that. I might give someone those four stations or those four exercises, two or three rounds every single day, five to six days per week, I should say, to try to improve range of motion and use a screen to figure out what, which of those drills, right? Use a screen to figure out, okay, it's the hip flexor, it's the quad, it's the front leg hamstring. Here are four drills that I can apply for those things and just hammer those things uh, every day up to that five to six days per week to try to make that really, really effective change, right? So that's a very different approach than the warm up, right? So I might do a warm up is a little bit different. I might do my actual increased range of motion doing a circuit or adding in some side stations at practice or something like that on different events. That's a very different approach than, you know, what I might just do to try to say recover the body, which is the third goal, right? A lot of people are showing or trying to say like, okay, I'm going to stretch after my workout because the, the body is warm and it's going to help them recover and increase their range of motion more. And again, when you look at the recovery literature on kind of like what that might happen. There's a really good uh, review study that came out in 2021 by Alfonso, Alfonso, which is uh, looking at the effectiveness of static stretching or stretching after a workout to improve recovery, right? So to get the body ready for the next day of practice. And essentially, they, they su summarized that there wasn't a lot of evidence to support the fact that static stretching or any type of uh, stretching is going to be significantly improving, um, you know, recovery for the next day. So there is some support to show that foam rolling helps to reduce perceived soreness after practices or after the next day. So if we are thinking about what can we do to get the body ready for the next day, maybe some soft tissue work, some foam rolling is good, but we have to be honest with ourselves and know that like programming and proper sleep and nutrition and hydration are way more important than foam rolling or stretching after practice, right? So again, in my head as a younger coach, I thought like, oh, after practice, we're warmer, let's stretch, right? That's going to help improve flexibility more. And I don't think it's working for that reason. I think it's because it's another session of consistently stretching to kind of get more positive changes on a, on a regular point of view. It's just another uh, stretching session to try to increase some of the tolerance to stretching. So I don't think we're making a huge improvement in post exercise flexibility with being warm, quote unquote. 
but I get that, I get that question a ton too. Like, Oh, should I static stretch after practice to make more flexibility gains? Should we use dynamic before for a warm up? And that the summary that I give people is what I just said is if the goal is to get the body ready for practice, right? Probably do some soft tissue work, do a dynamic stretch, add some static stretching and make sure we're doing some active flexibility and getting the body ready. If the goal is to increase range of motion, we want specific circuits that are going to do that along with some extra stuff going into maybe eccentrics and some of those specific side stations that might be really, really good based off of the screen of the athlete of what they need, right? Show us that we need these drills for hip flexors or quads or whatever else it is versus if the goal is to recover the body for the next day and get the range of motion kind of uh, to, to come back down after a hard workout, maybe some foam rolling, maybe some soft tissue work, maybe like a warm water soak is helpful for some athletes. They like that too as well, but I'm way more focusing on the programming of the proper, you know, strength conditioning and what we're doing day to day. And I'm educating on sleep and on nutrition and hydration, because that's probably going to make the most effect on recovering the body for the next day. Okay. So that's what I do now versus what I used to do, which is I used to just kind of like literally fly by the seat of my pants and hope that I was making a positive impact on stretching, never screen anybody, never have a marker of progress, just give random flexibility drills I found online or in Congress, right? Now I break it down to those three goals of is the goal to warm up, is the goal to actually improve range of motion or is the goal to recover the body? And I give three different approaches to flexibility and stretching based on what those things are. All right. So that's number three. Number four, uh, probably going to be very closely linked to the one that I just talked about is trying to make sure that you are having some sort of screening and basic education behind why someone doesn't have flexibility they need, right? So you don't need to be a medical provider. You don't need to read a ton of geeky research studies. You don't need to go way down the rabbit hole and just be a master here. But if you're someone who's coaching or working with athletes for flexibility, you need to know the basics of what they're trying to do, right? If you're trying to help somebody improve their split, and you don't know what needs to go well for someone to do a split, it's going to be really frustrating, right? It's gonna be really, really hard to make a positive impact on their flexibility, right? And I used to not do anything at all, like critically thinking wise about what might limit someone's split, I would see someone who doesn't have a split. And I would assume it's the hamstring and the quad or they need more stretching. And I would just throw seven drills at them or be really aggressive with their methods. So you need to stretch super, super hard, go super, super aggressive, right? And never actually critically think about what could be going wrong there. And as a medical provider, as I learned more and more, I realized there's a lot of things that can limit someone's split or can limit someone's overhead flexibility, right? So the example I think we can use here is that split or like a leap example, right? Just alone in the back leg, what can limit the back leg of someone's split going down all the way, right? Could be the hip flexor, it could be the quad, it could be the TFL muscle, and you would test those with what's called a Thomas test to break those things down, right? It could also be the groin tissue, the hip, the groin muscles also work as hip flexors. So that could also be an issue going on to test that you do a favor test where they drop their knee out to the side and see if they can laying on their back, drop their knee out to the side and see if their knee goes down within parallel to the table, right? But it could be a passive flexibility thing. Maybe it's not even something related to why their leap angle isn't hitting there. Maybe it's a uh, glute strength. Maybe it's something with the hip rotator strength, right? They don't have enough strength in their glute and in their hamstring muscles to lift their leg into the position they need, even though they have passive flexibility. So we would have to test those things out with like a muscle test using our hands or a handheld dynamometer to see what's going on, right? And even if it's that, maybe it's an active flexibility issue. Maybe they don't have control or understand technique. They don't understand how to engage their glute and their, and their core muscles to get their legs high enough during their split, right? That could easily look like someone who doesn't have a split angle all the way down, right? Also on the front leg, there's a lot of things that can limit why the front leg can't come up, which would limit someone's split going down totally or not hitting their angles. The sciatic nerve in the front leg is something that's very, very commonly an issue and it's it's not really, you know, appropriately worked on, or it might be just getting nerve tension, right? So someone's getting too aggressive in their types of stretching or the stretching is inappropriate. They're stretching with their toes flexed up in a pike stretch and it's pulling on the nerve and making it irritable. It could be the nerve itself is just not comfortable with the stretch and we got to change the way we're stretching and do what, we're, what are called nerve gliders to make that calm down, right? It could be a core position thing, right? Someone's really, really overarched in their posture and it's tugging on their hamstring and their sciatic nerve, and it's making it look like their pike flexibility or their split flexibility is bad. But the issue is more they have to hollow and get a nice core brace to let the hamstring relax. I've seen that in a ton of people, right? It could be true hamstring stiffness. You could have someone who truly does have tight hamstrings, and you'd have to work on that specifically on a different area, right? You would screen for that using a leg raise test with your toe pointed to see if that's an issue. But it could also be a hip flexor and a quad strength issue. Maybe again, their hip flexor is not strong enough to pull them against gravity up into that big giant leap position you want because the leg is you know long and it's it's got a lot of uh, you know force needed to lift it up into that position. So those are just eight things right there that could limit someone's split or uh, passive flexibility that all require different screens to to rule those things in and then vice versa, or sorry, in, in conclusion, they all also require different uh, exercises to improve them, right? So the, the front leg versus the back leg, passive flexibility versus active flexibility. I now, again, what I do differently is I'd rather take the extra 15 minutes to screen out 
all of these things and find the one or two things that are really the issue versus having 8 billion exercises thrown at someone to hopefully fix some of these things, right? I think it's a much more critical thinking approach and a much more specific approach than just shotgunning and trying to apply a bunch of drills. So I would I would suggest that everybody learns these screens, right? Learn what a Thomas test is, Google that, learn what a favor test is, do these things very specifically, learn from a medical provider and learn how to screen for all the things that could possibly be an issue and also break down why those things could be existing, right? And then focus just on those things. Don't do what I did and just go YouTube rabbit hole and get 47 drills from different coaching forums and just apply a ton of random drills and hope it gets, you know, progress then get frustrated when it doesn't, I'd much rather see people learn specifically what those components are, how to actually screen for them, and then what drills will fix them. And then again, apply the research we just talked about with consistently stretching and doing the right approaches with sets and days per week and reps and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Don't just be a knucklehead like I did and just randomly throw stuff against the wall and hope it sticks because one, it's frustrating. It's frustrating and you won't see progress, but two, you're probably going to ha uh, have some headaches down the road when you're not making any you know, progress towards the goals that you actually want. Okay. So that's four. And then five, probably the most important, right? But also something I wanted to make sure I, I talked about the other things first before I got to here is the biggest mistake I used to make is not knowing why stretching actually works. And it seems simplistic in my mind. And again, face palm moment is like, Back as a younger coach, I like literally had no idea why stretching worked. Like from a from a thought process point of view, I just stretched or gave flexibility exercises because I, you know, just did it. I just thought that was what was supposed to happen. So again, I used to think that stretching increased the flexibility like lengthwise. It stretched the muscles out and made them longer. And that was the biggest reason. And I don't want to dive down the rabbit hole about the science of this. I just want to, you know, highlight that there are a lot of really good uh, articles to support these things. Um, but there's two main reasons why you could actually see stretching improve passive flexibility. Okay. One is you're changing the muscle itself. You're actually stretching the muscle out over time. And two is that we're changing the nerves or the brain uh, in association with the, the discomfort of stretching, right? So what's called the tolerance to stretch. And you know, spoiler alert, unless you want to read the research, is that we think now it's much more about changing the nerves in the brain, the tolerance to stretch, we're changing the nerve sensitivity, and we're changing the brain's tolerance to stretching, we're not actually increasing muscle length over time, with that caveat of eccentric stretching, okay, that's the only thing eccentric loading, we think maybe there's some actual, like I said, fascicle length change over time. But the majority of other things that we do, so all the types of stretching, static, dynamic, PNF, um, consistently stretching over time, all that kind of stuff, soft tissue work, it's changing the, the the muscles perception of stretch, and it's getting more comfortable over time. And there's a lot of really good studies here that I'll bring up very quickly that if people want to read. Okay, so if you look at some of the more classic ones that are most uh, kind of cited in the physical therapy research, and you're looking at okay, like what, what's the proof here for why maybe this is something I should, you know, change my mind about. Um, the most kind of uh, prominent one is going to be from uh, Conrad in 2014, which is a really great paper, and then also Wepler in 2010. So this one was essentially looking at all the different types of static stretching and what can change the muscle or tendon structures. And they just summarized that with a lot of like, you know, stretching protocols, so three to four weeks, or even up to eight weeks, that the changes you see in range of motion were probably not due to the muscle getting longer over time. Okay, it was due to again, the brain changing, if you take a, a muscle and you stretch it to end range, it's uncomfortable, you're like, oh, it doesn't feel so great. And you have a moderate amount of discomfort. Why that feels uncomfortable is there's actually some receptors in the muscle itself called nociceptors that transmit a signal to your brain like, oh, this doesn't feel so great. You know, like, oh, we're getting kind of dangerous here. We're getting to the end of our, our comfortable limit before we cause some tissue damage. So it sends a feedback mechanism to your brain. Your brain produces pain to protect you to not overstretch those muscle structures, okay? So what's happening is that we're probably over time as we stretch five to six days per week with the right proper dosage and intensity, we're reducing the sensitivity, right? Or the threshold of that kind of like freak out moment of your brain to start being worried about it. And so there's been some studies that show like people who stretch for three to eight weeks in a hamstring stretch, they do increase muscle length over time. But it's not because of the muscle getting longer. It's because of, you know, again, the brain's tolerance to, to stretches is, is improving. So we're actually probably changing the, the range of motion more so by the muscle tolerance uh, improving, and not so by the muscle increasing length over time. So if you want to look at some of these studies, right, this is another one that just came out uh, from Longo 2021. They also were looking at changes over time of the calf muscles with consistent stretching. And again, they found over 12 weeks of static stretching with pretty intense protocols. Um, the changes were, were seen, they did have more range of motion at the ankle joint, the calf got more mobile or more, you know, range of motion, but it wasn't because they changed the tendon or the length of the Achilles or the muscle itself being longer. It was probably again, that tolerance to stretch. So uh, there's Wepler 2012, which is a really great study talking about modifying sensation that we're probably doing it from the brain changing. Um, there's uh, Conrad 2014, Longo 2021. 
which is also this great classic study from 2006 from uh, Hans Chandry and uh, Robert Schleep, who are kind of very, very well-known fascia, uh, fascia researchers. And again, they essentially used really geeky ways to show that we're probably not changing the fascia itself. We're not breaking down scar tissue with foam rolling. We're not, you know, increasing scar tissue length with stretching, right? We're probably just, again, changing the neurological things of our brain and of uh, the way that we approach some of our, uh, our tolerance to stretch. So if you guys are interested in that and you want to hear all the studies, go nuts. I think they're great. Some people don't, but essentially the, the summary here, right, is we're probably changing the tolerance to stretch and not the actual length of muscles over time, which is why back to the first point, consistency is more important than intensity because yes, it's uncomfortable. We want to cause some discomfort and stretching, but we don't want to just think about aggressive equals make muscle longer. So we're going to go super, super hard or hold for two minute plus holds. We'd rather screen somebody, find the right things they need and apply those exercises consistently with a nice discomfort level that's to tolerance, right? But not too much, too much pain to get someone's brain to over time increase the tolerance to stretch or calm down some of those nerves that are freaking out when you get to the end of your stretch, right? For a split or whatever. So again, even with the most aggressive types of flexibility, you might think about, right? Someone who needs rhythmic gymnastics, someone who needs huge switch leap angles, someone who wants to get a switch ring or a sheep jump, someone who wants to do, you know, crazy contortion stuff or circus or ballet, right? You still apply the same science over time. Okay. And so I hope that's just helpful to summarize. I'm going to go back and, and summarize these because I know it's a lot of information, but number one, right? Aim for consistency, not intensity, right? If you look at the research and you see what's the most effective of how to improve flexibility over time, you see consistency and, and based on a proper screening with the proper dosage is really, really important. Okay. So five to six days per week, two sets of 30 seconds per muscle group, and a lot of different things work. Static stretching will help you increase, increase range of motion. Ballistic stretching, probably not the most effective, but a lot of things work, passive, active, dynamic. Just make sure it's the right appropriate exercise for what you're trying to do. Okay. Number two, is try to make sure that you're approaching these things with science-based research supported methods that are easy to use in the gym. Okay. So don't just do random exercises and random approaches you see online. Think critically about what the literature says about how we need to do this thing. Aim for really, really great basic things done really, really well to perfection with a nice consistency mindset. That's probably going to be the most important thing to do, right? You don't need to do two plus minute holds. You don't need to do seven days a week of the craziest stretching ever. We need five to six days of two sets of 30 seconds per muscle group done consistently based off a screen is probably the most effective way to get started there. And then from there, you can tweak and maybe add more if you're not seeing progress. Okay. Number three. Like I said, is making sure you know the goal of the flexibility. Are we trying to increase range of motion or prep the available range of motion, or are we trying to recover the range of motion? So, if the goal is to prep the available range of motion, the warm up again, some dynamic work is probably good. Some soft tissue work is probably good. You can toss some static stretching in there. You can do some active flexibility stuff. But the goal is to to ramp the body up for training, right? And don't freak out if someone's a little bit stiff after a hard workout and their splits aren't down, their shoulders are a little tight, something like that. If the goal is to increase range of motion, we want to go with more of those circuit type approaches, right? So do some specific stretching or dynamic work, add in some of those eccentrics, add in those active flexibility drills and do a circuit of things based on a proper screen with what they need instead of just, you know, going crazy with three plus minute holds and going nuts on some of their long duration stretching. Okay. Number three, if the goal is to recover those things, right? The goal is probably going to be more just get the body ready for the next day. Yes. Some uh, soft tissue work like foam rolling can help re reduce perceived soreness. Uh, not a ton of support for stretching after practice to try to increase recovery probably not going to have another bout of stretching to to be like warm quote unquote and to make it you know more flexible probably just another bout of stretching consistency wise that's why you're going to see improvements if you do want to stretch after practice uh, and then probably focus more on sleep and hydration and nutrition and stuff like that instead okay number four right is trying to use a screen and understand okay what can not you know, what can be a factor in not having a split or not having shoulder flexibility or not having ankle flexibility, learn about those things, break those things down, screen for those things, and then apply the specific exercise that you need versus here's 17 drills that I saw on YouTube and hope that it goes well, like I used to do and make a, you know, a knucklehead decision for myself and not really see progress with the people that I, I was working with. So learn screens, learn why someone's flexibility could be stuck and then try to specifically apply those science-based protocols that we said to try to make sure we're doing the right dosage and effectiveness, okay? And then lastly, my mistake, not knowing uh, why stretching or why foam rolling or why soft tissue work works in the first place, right? Why active flexibility worked, okay? Summary there is that we're probably not changing the muscle length itself unless we're talking about eccentrics. We're probably changing the nerves and the brain's tolerance to stretch. So again, that's why it loops back to number one, which is consistency is being more important than intensity. So, all right. A lot of information there. I know that was quite a bit. Um, if you guys like this stuff and you really enjoy this, right? The one of the reasons we wanted to put this podcast out when we did is because we just launched a super 
you know, pretty comprehensive, but also very highly anticipated course with shift called the gymnastics flexibility blueprint. So if you're someone who works in these sports, gymnastics, cheerleading, dance, you're all, you want to learn your own flexibility methods and you want like literally exactly what I do every single day and summarizing all the best practices, all the exercises for right and left splits, pike, pancake, shoulder, wrist, ankle, designing warmups, you know, everything you could possibly need to make your life easier. We have that up now and available. So if you guys want to check that out, you guys want to head to shiftmovementscience.com backslash GFB course, right? So gymnastics flexibility blueprint course. That is where you're going to find everything to, to learn about the information and jump and stuff like that. So shiftmovementscience.com backslash GFB course is going to get you exactly what you need. And, and I think it's probably probably the most highly anticipated course that we've ever launched. And it's something that everybody has wanted for a long time. I've spent about 10 years working on this slowly, but surely, but I didn't want to put it out too aggressive, too fast until I really understood what works and just like, you know, throw random drills at, at people. I wanted to have a really good comprehensive summary of why I'm doing certain things, what actually works with people every day in the trenches and how do we apply these things practically, right? So if you're looking for pretty much everything I've ever done with flexibility and, and the things that I use every day, check the course out. And I think that will really help you quite a bit to, to make your life quite a bit easier. But if you guys don't want to check the course out and you just enjoyed this podcast, it would be a, the, mean the world to me if you could just share this with your coaching friends, your colleagues, your people on social media, because I, I think people really want this information. And I hopefully can provide a nice evidence based, you know, kind of like summary of what I think is, is really important for mistakes that I made. And hopefully this will trickle out into these communities and, and give people a little bit more hope of one, getting flexibility to actually stick around, but two is, is getting rid of some of the older outdated methods that are too aggressive and just really not appropriate. So hope you all enjoyed this episode and I'll catch you guys on the next one.